And it's another wonderful day in Calgary. We're heading into the summer, and I, I don't know what the weather's like uh, where you guys are at. Um, but I'm I'm really looking forward to Ooh, our nice. Uh, oh, nice, absolutely. So, so we all have nice weather. Um, on my side, the snow's melting as well, which makes me very joyful. Um, so today we're looking forward to another inter interesting discussion, um, and we're looking at transitioning from a Revelation 5 to Revelation 6, um, so the uh, prophetic portion of it. And uh, Carl, you made a comment before we start. You said it's the heart of the book of Revelation. So I think that's a really good uh, uh, place to start. So you did mention that you also did a sermon around uh, some of the content. So I'm going to hand over to you um, to, to kick you. us off. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really love this book of Revelation. It is so dynamic. Uh, we just had um, Passover here, and uh, we uh, celebrated the Lord's death on the cross. We died for us, and when he has been raised again, and we focused on the Lamb of God. So I took them to Revelation 5, and where John was in tears, he was heartbroken because... God was sitting on the throne with a scroll in his hand, but it was sealed and nobody was found to open it. And at last, uh, there was a lamb in the middle of the throne and he, he was able uh, to open the seven seals. And so chapter six is actually the starting point where, where these seven seals are opened. It is the beginning of the revelation of the prophecy of the end times. So this is a very, very dynamic chapter. Um, turning back, drawing back the curtain, showing us what is going to happen um, in the near future. So uh, you, you, you even see the, the, the dynamic of, of, of the story or how it, it, it's happening. If you're reading in verse one, chapter six, um, now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, you know, like thunder come. So it's almost when Christ opened that seal, the heavenly command came out for the events to start. And what is going to take place now? So the first event after the first seal has been broken is, and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. And if you look at the four first seals, it is four different horses with four different riders with different meanings. So, um, yeah, maybe we can start and look at the meaning of these different horses. Or maybe I should just mention all four of them. That'd be the nice. first one is the, the, the white horse. The colors are also important um, of victory, the horse. The second, when he opened the second seal, um, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. It's war, you know. Uh, the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked and behold, a black horse. Its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of four, the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of a barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. And the fourth seal, then I heard the voice, the fourth living creature say, come and look and behold, a pale horse. And its rider's name was Death and Hades followed him and they were given authority over a fourth important over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth okay so maybe uh really can give us some more light on those the meaning of those horses <laughs> yeah 
some terrifying images. Indeed. Yeah, so I think we've often heard about the four houses as laws, men of, of, of revelation. That's quite a widely known idea. <laughs> it's been used in popular imagination in various different ways. Um, so I think it's quite important what you stated, Carl, is that this is the beginning of the revelation of the prophecies. So this is the prophetic part. This is what was this was sealed and it's been revealed now. And the rest of Revelation is basically everything that we find within the seven seals and also containing in the seventh seal, already talked about these things, you know, um, the trumpets and so forth. And we'll discuss these things as we proceed. But let's now focus on the first six seals. Mm. So uh, the first seal is quite interesting. As you've said, there's a... a we read that there's a rider on a white horse, um, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and the crown was given to him. Now, white is usually associated with peace. So I think uh, one would be tended to think that in some way that he presents or brings or try to bring peace. And uh, we do see that he has a bow in his hand. And I think this is what also follows slightly later on, that he's a conquering and conquer. He's a great conqueror. And I think this is what the bow presents. And the crown was given to him, so somehow he will be a great ruler. Uh, the question is, to, to whom does this ruler refer? Um, this is, um, I think, one of the most, the more difficult aspects to discuss in the book of Revelation, because we do find a similar picture uh, in Revelation 19. Now, in Revelation 19, we also read about a man on a white horse, but in that case, it's clearly Christ. Uh, it's Jesus uh, in the second part from verse 11. And, and one of the interesting differences, out. yeah, one of the interesting differences is that Christ comes with a sword, whereas this individual comes with a bow as well. So there's yes, that's a def definite, definite difference between the two, as you've just mentioned. So although Christ also rides on a horse, uh, and that's quite late in the book, um, quite near the end, and we do read that he rides out in a great and mighty war. In that case, it seems to be the final war. Uh, I think most likely in terms of Revelation, probably the, uh, the great war of Armageddon that's been spoken of. And, but the difference is a sword going out of his mouth, and then he doesn't have one crown. He has many crowns because he's not merely a king. He is the king of kings. <clears throat> so the question is whether this uh, verse in chapter 6, verse 1, refers to Christ or not. Another one that is bringing peace and is, you know, uh, uh, come as a as, comes as a conqueror. Uh, in which case, maybe it's some a kind of antichrist that's being referred to here. And I think this is what is quite interesting: is to make a decision on this is not easy because you know there are many different viewpoints and um, uh, one will have to ask. So you know. How are one going to decide between these views? <laughs> and in my way of thinking, we shouldn't read Revelation on its own. It's yes. extremely important to read Revelation together with other Bible prophecies. Um, as I've said previously, you know, there are very few passages in Revelation that's not been taken from other similar and related passages elsewhere in the Bible. Um, in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. And in this case, it seems to me that the closest parallel is definitely uh, the prophetic discourse. So uh, if yeah, one just compares... Explain it. Just explain it. That's Jesus in... in yeah, last... yeah. In Matthew, for example, especially Matthew 24... Uh, where Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple, the signs of the times, the end of the age, all these things. Um, so in this case, we read how Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, where the disciples came to him and he asked him, 
Carl asked, when will these things be? Um, it refers to what happened just previously regarding the temple and so on. And Jesus, and, and the other question is, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I can probably and just then, read that uh, uh, verse, verse 4 and 5 if you want to do. Okay. Um, Jesus says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will deceive many. And he uh, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Yeah, and then if you read also verse seven, maybe a little by. Yes, uh, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrow sorrows. Yeah, so the things referred to here are things very similar to the kind of things that we read about in uh, Revelation 6. So if we do take these two chapters as kind of in, being in parallel, then uh, we do find here, um, first of all, false Christs, a reference to false Christs. And then we find a reference to great wars, rumors of wars, wars. And then we do find a reference to famine, to pestilence, all these things. These are the, exactly the same things that's being referred to in the Revelation uh, chapter 6. So since these things, it's actually in the same order. So it's first the false Christs, then uh, wars that's mentioned, then famine, and then pestilences and, you know, all those things, many people that will die. So this is very much the kind of order that we find in Revelation 6. And this implies that the man on the white horse with the bow in his hand is basically not Christ. That's why there's a contrast between the, the way that Christ is um, depicted on the white horse in great power and glory in, in, in chapter 19 from verse 11 with many crowns on his head and quite differently from this uh, this this uh, particular depiction here so it seems then that maybe this refers to or is related to what we find in Matthew as a reference to false uh, messiahs to a false christ and false christs so it's first the false christ then maybe the white wars will refer to a false kind of peace that it will bring upon the world and then the red wars, the wars, etc., and we can proceed with all these things. Um, I think what is quite interesting is the major question that one has before oneself is how these things can really be signs of the times. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I think a, a big problem is that that there has always, for all the ages, well, since the time of Christ, been false um, Christs, uh, even before that time and after that time. But others, after Christ, after the prophecy that came and said, you know, they are Christ, or in some way they have appeared. Uh, and there's, uh, I can, for example, mention Sabbatai Zevi. I mean, he was a a figure that was widely accepted in the Jewish community in the 1600s, you know, and yeah, there was great upheaval in the Jewish community and many thought he could be the Messiah. So there are many similar individuals through the ages and uh, wars, you know, as I mean, since the, since the earliest of times, wars are with us, you know, earthquakes, famine, pestilence. These things are not new. So the question one should ask is how these things could be signs of the times. I think this is the important question to answer. And you hear that often, you know, where people comment and say it's the signs of the times. Um, and it's it's almost a, a sort of a, a general comment that gets yeah. thrown out if something happens. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Yes. So these things, you know, have happened all the time. And how could this now be a sign of the times? You know, and it's also in Revelation. It's so Revelation starts in exactly the same way that Jesus starts the prophetic discourse, and uh, you know, but he starts it with false Christs, and then wars, and then um, famine, and then pestilence and death. And so it's exactly the same order, also. 
in which yes, I, exactly. uh, uh, mentioned. And then even yeah, the Martyrs, which comes yeah, afterwards, is also mentioned in, in, in Matthew. And also even the heavenly bodies that will, and the stars that will fall on, fall on earth, well, stars, you know, it's just an expression from the ancient yeah. world, but I mean, they will, um, uh, comets and so forth, that will definitely, in this case, is referred to, or referred to that will fall on earth. So it's the same things I mentioned in both passages. Yeah, and it's it's interesting if you look at um, just just war, and you look at Matthew uh, verse six to seven, it refers to nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Yeah. In yeah, Revelation yeah. three to four, it says power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill yeah. one another. Um, so exactly. This yeah, thing. that's the second one, eh? That's the, the red horse. Yeah, yes, so yes. then after seems to be a false peace and then this great wars that erupts. But I think the answer to that problem uh, is found in chapter eight, in, in Revelation chapter 24, verse 8. You've, I think you've read this passage. Matthew. All these are the beginning of the sorrows. Matthew. Yes. Yeah, so the word sorrows are actually, uh, actually as the key. This is the key for understanding this passage. Uh, because the word sorrows is actually refers to the kind of pain, the birth pangs that a woman experiences before giving birth. This is what is actually mentioned here in this in this um, in this instance. So this means that we should have a look at that, and I'm trying to understand these things. So what is important about birth pangs is it's uh, there's an intensification. Uh, it's closer in time to each other. It becomes more intense. Eventually comes the moment of birth. And in the same way, these things will become more intense. It will become more drastic and, you know, uh, follow on each other in a higher intensity, in, in a higher frequency and intensity. And eventually will be the coming of Jesus Christ. So and I think that's a, the Yeah. Valin, I think that's a very positive way of looking uh, looking at it, um, you know, in terms of the birthing process. So it becomes really difficult and challenging intensification and then suddenly this, this I almost want to say, new life uh, arrives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Carol, so do you want to... Like... Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Vili. No, no, no. I'll let Carol... I just want to... Yeah, it... yeah they are, uh, uh, another place in the Gospel, it says, you know, the... Um... The intensity of the um, tribulation will be so severe that even the uh, elected, if it the time wasn't shortened, they wouldn't be able to bear it. So the the intensity will clearly increase as well as the frequency. And then, interesting, if you if you keep on reading in Matthew twenty four, it says immediate uh, verse twenty nine immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. So um, we here we read about earthquakes and nature um, being uh, disrupted, but it will reach a point where it is so severe that you know even. The, the very steadfast um, powers of nature will be affected. That we thought we, in our language, we have all these idioms, as sure as the sun comes up, you know, it is set. But there will come a time that even these things will be shaken. It will be so severe. Um, and if you continue to read um, the seals being opened, I think it's the sixth one. We have not really touched upon it yet, but there you also see how severe these signs will be. If, if we, uh, the first four seals uh, were the, the, the riders of the horses. The fifth one is the martyrs. It talks about the martyrs, which were also mentioned in uh, Matthew chapter 24. And then these signs on the, uh, uh, the, the cosmic powers. Uh, yeah. Verse 12, Revelation 6, 12, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. You see the precise same things mentioned. The stars fell from the earth. Um, the sky vanished. Um, 
yeah, and then the people, it, it seems the earth will be sh shaken so severely. I was thinking if, if there is such a big earthquake that even the mountains are shaken and the islands are moved, uh, probably all the buildings will be flattened and there will be nowhere to stay and the people will flee into caves and into mountains to hide. Uh, for the wrath of God and of the Lamb. This is the only place where the the Lamb is actually gentle and loving. His wrath is mentioned because of the sin of man. Yeah, yes. so I believe to answer your question, it is the severity of these things will increase greatly. Yeah, so let's if we focus now on this first verse, we find this um, this man on the white horse. And we've already seen in um, Revelation 24, it refers to it Matthew. Would agree, uh, Matthew 24. Sorry, it would mm -hmm. uh, agree with the with the false prophets, with the false Christs. You know, those that come and say they Christ. But what is interesting in one John chapter two is 18. We read something very interesting. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have come so here we have exactly this kind of difference so there will be many false christs but eventually in this final intensification of false christs appearing there will be the antichrist that will the final antichrist so this is clearly stated in john here in chapter two clearly states this so through the ages, there will be many false Christs, but eventually there will be a particular false Christ that will be the manifestation of the, um, the, the if we take all these different false Christs that have ar ar arisen through the ages, he will be the final and the most potent one and uh, very evil. Uh, what's uh, and so forth but the point of the matter is this will be the final and the most intense moment so the fact that it's one person on a horse seems to refer to this final moment this final period when the antichrist will arrive on the scene we see the same intensification carl has mentioned the stars falling and the you know all these the heavens that shaken and so forth but one can one can also see this with regard for example to the persecution of the, of, of, of the Christians. You know, Jesus mentions that. And what is interesting in the in, in this uh, 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 Matthew chapter 24, we read it will be a great revelation. There's the only two places where we find this word is great revelation is in Matthew 24 and in Revelation chapter 7. So the great tribulation tells us there would be many tribulations and many of them would be extremely terrible. But eventually, the final one right at the end, the most severe and intense one will obviously be the great tribulation. So we can see this. So once one understands this intensification, um, this birth pangs as a symbol, then one can understand. So the re these things are not just... Um, signs of the times it's the intensification that is the key to understand it so as the times gets closer at the end of times these things will become more and more severe and the final antichrist will arrive the great tribulation will arrive this massive wars that will cover the whole earth seemingly will uh, eventually come to a climax in the war of armageddon and this and the um we'll, we'll find this even shaken and stars expression in the bible um that fall fall on earth so it's quite a fascinating picture that's actually being presented once we compare matthew 24 um prophetic discourse with um revelation chapter 6 absolutely and uh, did you guys want to say something about uh, the 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 time duration seven years that kind of thing. Um, this is not yet in this passage. So at this passage, yeah. we just first, you know, like the prophetic discourse. It's an overview. Yeah. It gives a good idea of things to come. But I think we should take the prophetic discourse as a kind of guideline. So at this yeah. stage, the rest of the prophetic discourse 
is more particular, there's more, more details, particular things will happen from verse 15. And the same is the case with Revelation. Later on, as we move forward, we'll come to very particular things being described and so forth. And I believe the very same things being described as in the prophetic discourse. But at this stage, chapter 6, it's just a kind of overview of these things that will come to pass and how these things will come in greater and greater um, uh, power on earth, more intense, more greater in frequency. We will see terrible, terrible, terrible things in a way that we have not seen. So it's not, it's a similar things, but the scale all over the earth will be really terrible. So I think in my way of reading it, this white horse most likely refers to peace. Maybe the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, will bring a, a false peace. And then the result will be the second horse. We read that um, in the second, um, second oh, verse 3, ne? Yeah, verse 3. Yes. That he will take the, um, he will take the peace, he will remove the peace from the earth. Um, and so that the people would kill each other. And it was given to him a great sword. So clearly this is terrible wars that we're talking about. So terrible and ugly wars will break out. Now, you know, the intensification of war, one can, for example, refer to there were many wars throughout the ages, terrible and great nations fought against each other. But, you know, a century ago, we had the First World War. And then we had the Second World War. So this is the first time in history that the whole earth became involved in war. And what the Bible is actually saying is that, you know, people often talk about the possibility of a third world war. So in this way of understanding things, this is exactly what will happen, is that there will also be an intensification of war. So in the same way that the first war and the second war, there was uh, many um, nations all over the world becoming involved. Uh, definitely in future, I believe, we'll see similar things happening, even on a larger and a more massive scale. Um, and then uh, on the third, the, when it comes to the third seal, the, the black horse is at a pair of scales in his hand. And this refers to scarcity of these things that will have to be weighed carefully. And he refers to about, you'll have a meal, you'll have a day's work for a meal of wheat and a day's work for three meals of barley. You know, that's it'll be really food will be scarce, it will be famine, it will be extremely difficult times. Uh, and then at the uh, in verse seven, death, you know, other things like um, uh, it, it actually mentions all these things, um, but clearly, pestilence, all these things are involved here uh, the hunger, death, and so forth. Um, so one can see how these things progress, you know, the one. Not necessarily, I think these things would not necessarily follow on each other, but all these things will happen, and one will be probably related to the other. You know, during the war, one finds scarcities, for example, we have now seen with the war in Ukraine, for, where, for example, many nations that were dependent on the Ukraine for grain at severe shortages. And, you know, when the war is really a great war and it involves uh you know also wars in the sky the sky will be blackened one will it will be really a terrible time i believe um so so i do have one one uh question i this is actually that i get from people so when you when you look at the rider of the white horse that represents an individual now if you look at uh, the pale horse you look at the black horse you look at the red horse um how do you see that as a specific individuals? Does it refer to situations? Um, and I know we're going to go into more depth around that, but uh, just for those guys that are a bit yes. more curious. So in my view, it's possible uh, that the first horse refers to a particular individual because he, gives, he got a crown and he's go, going out to conquer. So it seems that it's more than just a piece or something it uh, seems to reverse but in the other cases i think it's more symbolic just 
referring to war uh, that is coming, you know, and all these other things that's been re referred to. So I won't see that necessarily as individuals that's been involved. Yeah, I, I just think that uh, it's just symbols for these things that will follow on each other and maybe at the same time, but, you know, it's been expressed in this progressive way as things that will happen in the same way that we found it mentioned in that order in Matthew 24. Yep. Coral, um, uh, anything else to add to that? Yeah, as Valia has mentioned, um, it seems that Revelation chapter 6 is almost like an introduction and an overview yeah. of what um, of the end times, but also of how things will be in these last ages. Um, it, it will not be peaceful and smooth riding. There will be wars. There will be famine. Um, there will be earthquakes and so on. But it will grow more intense as the uh, image of the birth pangs explains to us. And then it seems that in uh, the seventh seal, it is like um, the book or the prophet, the prophecies zoom in on the last short uh, period of time in much more detail. How will it be close to the end? And um, specific events and detailed events are explained and what will happen in Jerusalem and so yeah. on. Um, so it seems that uh, chapter 6 of Revelation in a sense determines what will uh, what will, what would life on earth be in these last ages. Mm. It will grow more intense but then when the end really comes it explains it in much detail. How will it be? What will happen? But but it will not be that different. It will it will be the same things repeated, but the scale will grow. I think it says there one fourth of the earth, and later you read that uh, this judgment will be one third of the come over one third of the rivers and the people and later on I think it's two thirds if I remember correctly oh, the entire earth, the entire earth yeah. well, the whole earth yeah. so yeah. clearly you can see the intensity growing so this actually paints the picture These this chapter 6 paints the picture mm. what life would, will be on earth after Christ has lived and when he will come again what life will be um, and what how it will be at the very end. Yeah, and I can also mention um, the fifth seal. Uh, he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God mm -hmm. and for the testimony which they held. And uh, we see them in heaven. Uh, they are um, standing um, under the altar. Um, those that had been slain. A rope was given to them, and they did that, that they should rest a, a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. So this is quite terrible. So it means that through persecution, these people had died. We see them under the altar in heaven uh, where they've gathered. And then throughout Revelation, we see references to them. Chapter 7, we see this great multitude and we read that they came out of the great tribulation. We read about them later on in chapter 13, uh, standing in the same, uh, at the same place in heaven, um, where we also read about these martyrs. We read about them in chapter 19. Uh, and in that case, we read that God has, through his um, wrath, has actually revenged the death of his, of his people, of his servants. So there's also a continuation to uh, Revelation regarding the martyrs. Um, and I also... Sorry, William. 
No, it's so fine. Just, just to add on on the martyrs, um, I've also come across some interesting information about the altar. Um, on the altar, sacrifices of blood were brought, animals were slaughtered, and it was actually the blood that brought the, um, uh, what is for Shunam, propitiation. Um, but in the Old Testament, it says that the soul of the animal or of the person is in the blood. If, if the blood is gone, the life is gone. So in that sense, like you see the um, Abel's, Abel was killed, his blood was shed on earth, and his blood was calling out to God for justice. That's interesting. And in, in the same way, it seems that the blood of the martyrs is calling out to God for justice, mm -hmm. not um, for revenge or to be better, but for justice. Mm -hmm. um, because it is connected to the altar and the blood. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, so probably that why why they're under the altar. Yes, that because the blood's I'm running down. Yes, yeah. But this is a heavenly scene. So you remember that the earthly tabernacle were made. Moses, according to the Bible, made it uh, exactly as the mirror image of what he was shown in heaven. So this is the heavenly tabernacle of God where we find these things. But the parallel are definitely clear. Mm -hmm. Um. Lebay, maybe you can show us. You've prepared a slide uh, yes. about the, um, you know, uh, 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 Matthew twenty-four and uh, Revelation chapter six, just in comparison. I can definitely next do that. To each other, and we can maybe just show the listeners. I just need to quickly um, open it up, and I can. So I think so. Uh, what we'll do throughout this course and this discussion is we will always try to relate the book of Revelation with the rest of Scripture because this will help us to not just go on all sorts of <laughs> journeys and you know um, paths that is you know leading us to different um, uh, in different ways. One can go actually on any path from Revelation because, you know, there's so many possibilities to understand the symbols and so on. So if one don't have a sort of guide, then it's, I think, one could end up being really in, uh, understanding it not in the right way. So it's very important to take the rest of Scripture as our guide. So this is what we're doing. Um, so, um, uh, Levi, so if you can share that to us. Yes. I'll say, yeah. So, yeah. Did you want to quickly run through that, uh, Vali, or do you want me to read through it? Yeah. So, I think uh, the, we've already gone through everything. But so, mm. what we just see here, you know, on both sides is uh, on the in the first case, it's uh, deception. You know, this white horse, and he's. Uh, uh, um, we've seen that he agrees with the false messiahs, the false Christs. So that's the reason why we. I uh, came to the conclusion this is that this is most likely a reference to the final Antichrist. Um, that will be on the scene. Then we, in both cases, we have a reference to, to war. We have a reference to famines, death, and so forth. We have the martyrs in both cases, uh, in both mentioned in both passages. And we have these great signs in heaven. Um, the blackening of the heavens, of sun and moon, the stars that will fall on earth, heavens that will, you know, um, like a book, like a scroll <laughs> that's being closed in that way. The heavens, it's just a marvelous picture image, like the, the, the whole of heaven will just be, you know, in, in its entire just have a meltdown in a certain way. So it's terrible things that have been, been described here. Yeah. So one last question. I think we're uh, sort of uh, gotten to the end of the discussions. Um, as the body of Christ, how do we prepare for these things? I think the one, uh, one, one thing that stands out is the fact that we do need to study, study this. Um, Carl did do you have any comments around that? Yeah, sure. Um, it is so amazing that we can be informed 
of God's will and the end times and that we can have understanding of what is taking place on the one side. On the other side, we have to understand that when these challenging times really get tough, it creates opportunities for the kingdom. When people are in, in, in despair, um, that is when they call out to God. And that is when the church and the children of God must react and say, the Lord is still there. He's, um, he's, the door is still open for you. You have still time to repent and to turn back to God. Um, uh, even, you know, uh, many people go into war zones and uh, where there's famine. And like now, I have a good friend in the Ukraine. And uh, there are teams of people uh, reaching out to the, to the uh, people who are trapped in the uh, bomb shelters who have no food, old people, and they go and help that, those people and they serve them and they love them. So it really, as the end times will get tough, it will also create opportunities for the kingdom, which we should use to get people into the kingdom. Yes. Valley. Yeah. yeah, and I think Jesus have said, you know, I've said all things before, all these things beforehand. So when they happen, you will remember that I have told you that it will come apart. Come Isn't that apart. beautiful? So, so I believe that this is the wonderful thing that as these things unfold, we know that this is what the Lord has said to Himself, as these things will happen. But we will next time when we. As we proceed and we come to the eventually other after the seventh seal and so on, we'll discuss in much more detail the particulars given in the book of Revelation. But it's, it was nice looking at these things. Perfect. And Vili, what will we be discussing during the next conversation? I think next time will be chapter seven. We, we move from chapter to chapter, so I believe next yes. time will be chapter seven. Yes. Uh, for anybody that wants to read chapter seven uh, before we have the discussion, what do you think they should be focusing on? One or two key well, parts. Well, it's the parts are not the forty-four thousand and the, and those that came out of the great tribulation, so they can just read it and maybe read some commentaries that they have some background and maybe being an informed listener and they could send us questions. We would be glad to receive questions for discussion as we proceed with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. That'd be wonderful. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, my day is basically starting so I can go out into the sunshine, whereas you guys are heading into the evening. Um, but uh, thanks. Thanks very much again. And if anybody wants to send us some questions, um, you know, info at the Bible GPS.com. And again, I just wanted to, to refer uh, to, um, you know, at, at the bottom of uh, the YouTube um, you know, little clip. There is some links to Vili's blog post, to the Bible GPS website, and uh, some other uh, bits and pieces. So, so feel free to to take a peek and please like and share uh, this this uh, YouTube video as well. It'll really help us out. So, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate your time. For more information about the Bible GPS, please visit our website at thebiblegps.com. Please subscribe to our channel, share the video, like it, and leave us a comment. You can also support our ministry by donating. All the information is in our website. Thank you and God bless.